Hello and welcome to this edition of Citizens Hour on West Africa Democracy Radio 94.9 FM, The Car Senegal. On Citizens Hour, we bring interactions on governance and democracy with the aim of creating and enhancing awareness of democratic principles and processes and build a cult of democracy, peace and citizenship in the sub-region. This program is also broadcast on our partner stations across the sub-region and all of our social media platforms. I am Imo Edit, your anchor. Welcome. Democracy, arguably started as one of the best forms of governance among others, as such as authoritarianism, libertarianism, colonialism, monarchy, anarchy, and military rule, just to mention a few. Despite some of its shortcomings, democracy remains the primary choice of governance to many countries globally, to which Africa and many West African countries are in indifferent. Defined as governance by the people, to the people and for the people through various forms of representation, the potency of democracy has been heavily questioned and criticized in recent times, with one big basic question on the lips of many West Africans. Has democracy truly brought about the needed development? Are the true fundamental principles of democracy adhered to by our leaders? Or what are these fundamental principles of democracy? Now, let's spotlight Ghana as millions of registered voters will go to the polls on Saturday, December 7, 2024 to elect a new government. We will be sampling the opinions of some Ghanaian citizens in a series of reports and interviews from different regions of the country on what democracy means to them. But first, let's head to Kumasi, where Emmanuel Asedu of our partner radio, Focus FM, has been speaking to some youth on manifesto and democracy and what these two means to them. Take a listen. The 2024 elections will represent a defining moment in Ghana's economic, culture, politics, and importantly, the rule of the youth, unlike any other. The involvement of young people between the ages of 15 and 35 years is inadequately in the inclusion of decision-making in Ghana. The youthful population comes as an increasing opportunity for growth. Now, Ghana Statistical Service 2022 Annual Household Income and Expenditure Survey Report on the labor force indicate that the country recorded an average of 13.4% to 13.9% unemployment rate across all quarters of 2022 and an estimated 1.74 million that is 13.4 percent of the total working population of 13 million was unemployed within the first quarter of the same year with females twice as high as that of males these numbers are youth more so the economic and political dynamics nuances and needs of gen z's millennials and soon gen alpha have still not been fully explored by any political party or economic policy. For some youth in Kumasi City, South Central Ghana, who shared their views with WADR, highlighted how young people have influenced the country's democracy even at a minimal participation. Democracy is a system. It's a system of choice. You give the people the choice to decide for themselves. It's a system whereby the people are allowed to elect a representative to stand in for them in parliament. Okay, so democracy. Democracy is a system of government. Okay, whereby the people is for the people and by the people. They take charge of everything, directly or indirectly. They elect representatives to stand in for them. And there are instances where sometimes they make their own voices heard through demonstrations and other peaceful ways. Okay, so democracy is a system of government whereby the people more or less make their own decisions. I'll, sim I'll simply put it as uh, democracy is the one style of governance where the people are part of the governance. So it, it wouldn't um, necessarily be that there will be an election, but there can still be a, a democracy. So a democratic system could be where people are allowed to voice out their opinions on issues, allowed to um, 
uh, help in the decision taking process and then help in steering policies it's uh, i think ghana ghana has enjoyed a period of like um, stable democratic governance from the 1960s coming apart from the um the few times you know the hiccups in the governance coup d'etats and all that i think ghana has enjoyed quite a considerable amount of years when it comes to democracy the of, uh, our first president that is nkuma during the Colonial, colonization where when when before this type of ideology came about that the white allowed us to have a representative to stand in for us so that's where i could see that was the, at the beginning the foundation of democracy so from increment time to now i could say democracy is one of our main uh, priority something it has made Ghanaians have peace with all these said how powerful then is the voice of the youth here is Nathaniel Tete, a youth leader. Once the youth get up and say that oh, we are protesting against this particular happening or this thing, we can use some similar and uh, something the current happenings in like Ghana's list, uh, illegal mining and all that. If the youth decide to you know, protest, the country is going to stand still. So the youth, the youth has a very you know, powerful voice when it comes to demonstration. They play like key roles, not a single role, but a key roles in the democratic happenings of each and every country. So yes, the, the youth has power when it comes to democracy. You say the youth has a lot of power. In every country, it is the youth that brings about the forwardness and the, the growth of every country. Talking about Ghana, in terms of democracy and the aspect of the youth being involved, I could say we are the powerhouse of the country. Because without the youth, the progression of the country would, would have a lot of effect. So in my country, as in Ghana, the youth voice are needed in terms of contributions, in terms of ideas, because they have it. They are the ones growing. They are the ones who have the energy to bring about production in the country. So the youth has a lot in terms of democracy. There is no way that the youth must be excluded from democracy. They have a core part to play when it comes to democracy. Well, we, we have protests and other stuff. So when the youth, when they put their mind to something, they have a lot of ways to achieve, and it's you. I mean, democratic ways with the illegal mining, as my colleague said earlier. Well, I've read a lot of news about it, where there are some constituencies or some places the youth they did some demonstrations in other peaceful ways, and they've been able to drive illegal mining out of those places. Every time there has been a change in um, a change in paradigm when it comes to governance, is the youth that caused the change. I mean, for the very first time, we had a democratic movement somewhere in Europe. It was the youth that, that caused the change. And even in Ghana here, when Nkrumah um, was, was agitating for self-government now, he used the youth. A classical example is the positive action that took place, public disobedience and all of that. It was the youth. So, and, and, and a very recent one is what happened in Kenya, where the youth stood against the government. And... Uh, these all these policies, they will come, you know, flashes, flashes, sparkling policies. But then when they come to power, it's it's, it's a mess. They under deliver, you know, their promises. Now, all this manifesto reading, I don't actually put much faith in it because yeah. someone could write to you an amazing story, at the end come and portray a different thing. Reporting for WADR, my name is Emmanuel Asiedu Kumase. Thank you, Manuel Asidu, for that. Well, democracy offers a share in the government of the country to every citizen. Many experts believe that what touches all should be decided by all. For community and traditional leaders, you cannot underestimate their roles and how they have strengthened democracies over the years. They have evenly made democracy very functional at the grassroots level. This is the case of Damango, the capital of Savannah region in northern Ghana. Gogu Edwin of a partner station, Pad Radio, has been speaking to a queen mother, Bombo Achie Memumatu, and Chief Hamed Abdallah Tolodom Peura on the importance of their roles in a democratic setting. You know, as a human institution, at times, um, you find one or two people stating their positions mm. clearly, but which shouldn't be the case. Yes, which shouldn't be the case because as a chief or a queen mother, 
of any community you belong to the people mm. the people belong, belong to you you don't have to whether in this MPP you belong to any of the parties so but uh, as a human institution you find your colleagues as a queen mother as a, a chief at times we don't want you to be using us as queen oh, mothers. Yes. We are chiefs. Oh, yeah. yeah, we are women chiefs. Yes, okay. Because queen, if uh, the uh, queen Elizabeth were not to bring the English word, exactly. how will <laughs> we queen mothers? Would have uh, oh, what would have been our name? Mm. So we are we are also chiefs. Okay. So when you come with a letter saying chiefs, I'm always there, okay. whether you stay the queen or. Chief, I'm um, there. Okay. So um, it's unfortunate at times uh, you find some of our people putting themselves in a position, mm. actually, which is uh, which is not the best. All right. Yes, we should be neutral people so that we don't pray for doom. But when there's a problem, we should be able to come in and see how we will negotiate with whatever the, uh, problem they have to keep peace because ours is peace wow. and peace is health mm -hmm. what I, I would have wished our chiefs and our politicians now that they are looking for their political positions they come to us they listen to us I would wish when they have the, uh, their positions mm -hmm. they should still come to us listen to us because what I think about governance is, is from the bottom to up. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, for my few days in in F, <laughs> looking at the way they, they, they do their things, is from the up to down. Oh. But it should be from the down to, to the top. So I would have wished, now that they are looking for this, their support, for their votes, and they are listening to us, after elections, whatever they want to do for us, they should still come to us, listen to us, and send it to wherever it will get to to sol solve our problems. Yes, because their way of bringing things from the top to down, it doesn't help. All right. Yes, it should be from the bottom to, to the top. So we practice the system of checks and balances where, um, like I said, you have the president, you have the cabinet, you have the, uh, what do you call it, the, 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 the council of state, you have the, um, uh, what the, the, the legislature, that's parliament. And you also have the non-state uh, recognized fourth arm, which is the media. And all these people come together and check each other. So it's a theory of separation of powers, then checks and balances. The powers have been separated by these various groups of people. Then they check each other. For example, the president cannot make laws on his own unless the laws come to parliament. Before the law, you know, from parliament, it goes back there for ratification. So you see, from president to parliament, then back to president again. So it makes it, you know, much easier. Then also, if this law is still seen by people outside to be a little bit out of their way, they go to court. And the court takes a decision because they then, you know, make a decision. So they, and then, you see, what the decisions that take, court takes on some of those things is what they call the judicial precedents. When the matter has been handled by the court, it's also become law. So in our democracy, we have laws made by parliament, and we have laws also that were there before parliament came. And we have laws that come as a result of the fact that the judges have ruled on a matter, and it becomes also a law you know, to be practiced. Leadership in politics should be truthful. We don't expect 100% truth, but then to some extent, what they cannot do, they should not make it like they can just do it fully. Also, they should not degrade their opponents. Human beings are human beings. Yes, that you were not born 
uh, you know, just that you don't belong. No, you were not born for my mother. You don't belong to my side. That's not mean you think more than me. You should not also think you know more than them or they know more than you. At each time, everybody knows what he or she knows. I'm just talking and you're saying, well, well, when you start to talk to me, I'll begin to see that I don't know anything because there's a lot that you know that I don't know. So people must cultivate this habit of understanding that you just don't know everything more than anybody. He's sitting here. I don't know what he ate before coming here. So he knows what I don't know. Because if they come and put us to this and say, if you don't say what he ate, I'll slaughter you. They will slaughter me because I don't know. But they go and say, if you don't say what you ate, he will say, oh, I ate this. So you see, let us not you know, undermine people's intelligence. Let the people that are, you know, they not use, utilize people just for what they want, just because they want it, and damn them. That is also another source. And then the worst of it is that let's not use money to induce people to vote. Because if it does, it becomes like it's not money crazy. Uh, and then uh, it, it will be like uh, if, if the people use the money, you vote because you are giving money. Then expect that, you know, you get money again to vote. But then development may not take place. 20 years after getting money to vote, that is when you begin seeing the impact of it. Because the whole money has been drained. Where individuals will have more money than government. And when individuals start getting more money than government, there will be inflation, there will be uh, people agitation. When it starts, it doesn't have problem, but when it gets endemic, that's where the problem comes. That was Gogo Edwin of our partner station, Pad Radio, speaking there to a queen mother, Bombuwoche Memumatu, and Chief Ahmed Abdallah Tolundum Pewura on the importance of the roles in a democratic setting. Citizens Hour on West Africa Democracy Radio. It's your time to speak. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Citizens Hour, your democratic and governance program. Now let's get deeper into the conversation as we break down democracy and the fundamental principles. Let's head back to Accra as Christopher Teacher is on standby with our guest. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Imo. I have held it very strong down in Ghana. And a big thank you to all of our listeners across the world. Thanks so much for joining us for the second half of the program's citizens uh, as we go deeper into the fundamental principles of democracy, especially in this election year in Ghana. Latest report by Afro Barometer shows that there is a significant decline in citizens' confidence in Ghana's democracy. Ironically, many young people who never experienced military rule are desirous of it based on delusions, a point we must strive not to reach ever. In the Guinea-Bissau, citizens there will head to the polls on Sunday, November 24, 2024, followed by Ghana on Saturday, December 7, 2024, and later next year, Côte d'Ivoire in October 2025 will also head to the polls. So obviously, the stakes, the drama, the tensions are so high ahead of the polls. In fact, it has already started in Ghana and Guinea-Bissau with Omaru Sissoko Imbalo saying he will not seek a second term. Interesting. We will touch base on that later. But let's come back to Ghana. And my guest for today's conversation on democracy and fundamentals principles is one passionate man who is well vested with lots of understanding about democracy, governance and the rule of law. He has worked for about a decade with the United Nations as Senior Governance Advisor in Tanzania, as a Senior Special Advisor at the United Nations Missions in Liberia also. He is also the co-founder of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, and he is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the John Ejikum Kufour Foundation. My guest is Professor Bafo Ajimandia. Thank you so much for the opportunity with me, sir. It's my pleasure. 
honestly, I'm very honored because when it comes to matters of democracy and it comes to matters of rule of law and the future, you're very passionate about it. And of course, here at West Africa Democracy Radio, we say thank you so much once again. So let's go straight to the point. When we talk about democracy, what is it in your opinion and why does it remain the best choice of governance? Democracy, as we know, is a concept that has uh, different interpretations. Mm. But after all is said and done, I think we just fall on uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, brief uh, definition, mm. saying simply, it's a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. In other words, it's a people-centered government. Mm. And that tells you that any government that is built on the free will of the people, mm. having the choice to select that government mm. through elections mm. or any other means that we can devise, a government that allows for full participation of citizens, a government where there's rule of law, a government that ensures the freedoms and liberties of people, all together makes it a democratic form of government. Mm. And so, at the back of that, a people-centered governance is democracy. What would the other forms of governance be? Well, other forms, as we know in history, uh, these days we don't hear much of them, uh, could be socialism, mm -hmm. that was practiced uh, in some Eastern European countries before the fall of uh, the Soviet Union. Or you can say communism, that the then Soviet Union and even China sought to uh, establish. Mm. So we used to have this uh, Chinese Communist Party, which is still there in a way, mm. but as we know, it's gone through very, very interesting and major changes. Mm. So there are all forms of government. We have monarchical governments where we may have a, a king ruling the country. Mm. Uh, then, of course, even within the democratic settings, you mm. can have an autocrat, what you call autocratic government, a mm. government where the leader seems to uh, put himself above the people mm. or authoritarian government where even if it's a democracy where authority is more or less concentrated in the executive who blatantly uh, may use it mm. against the people. Mm. So all this may be variations but the extreme end of democracy will be communism or socialism which mm. as I say uh, we don't hear much uh, like Cuba mm. it was supposedly a communist country but now we don't hear much of that. Mm. So democracy that we talk about today it, it doesn't mean it is the only form of government or even the best form of government. No. Mm. And as uh, I think uh, this British uh, Prime Minister during the war period mm. said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all, for all the other forms of mm. government. So in other words, democracy, as much as we like it, we have to recognize that it has so many pitfalls and that is always work in progress. Mm. Right. So it means democracy is, is, is a work in progress and it evolves. You touched about communism and um, socialism. Uh, in our current dispensation, are these two elements displayed in here? And would, is, is it what is termed as the parties, uh, I mean, political parties, ideology? Because we hear some people say I'm communist or uh, I'm communist, in other words, capitalist, where um, factors of production, means of production are in the hands of a so individual, whereas the socialists believe it is government distributing and allocating resources? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, these days, as I say, or rather I should say that every political system has its ideology. Mm. Like you rightly pointed out, when you talk of a communist or socialist system, the ideology is that the state should be the main provider. It should be the main creator of wealth, mm. capital, not in the hands of the private sector. Mm. And therefore, the state tends to dictate how life will be for citizens, mm. more or less. I'm simplifying, but mm. that's the truth. On the other hand, if we talk of democracy, there's a certain ideology behind it. You can say it's a capitalist ideology because democracy, because of the freedoms that mm. it gives to individuals, 
enables individuals to pursue wealth and happiness. Okay. You see, which means that the wealth of the nation will be created more by the people themselves, the individuals, rather than the state. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of interesting differences between uh, uh, between these various uh, political systems. Mm. But overall, overall, I think uh, if you look at the human character, all of us like freedom. Every human being likes and loves and must believe in freedom. Mm. And if you look at the other systems of government that we just discussed, almost all of them, except democracy, they all tend to suppress that human uh, value, mm. the love of freedom, because the state wants to dictate to you what you have to do. Mm. But the democracy, on the other hand, gives you freedom, except, of course, the restrictions that may be placed on you mm. through law. Okay. So... At the back of freedom that democracy gives, then we tend to ask about everything. There are principles, and principles are values, and values determine how things would obviously play out. So we want to know, are there some principles when it comes to democracy in a, in a state of freedom? Yes. It's built on certain principles. What are they? They include the, the liberties that I mentioned, the freedoms, the idea that there should be full participation in the governance processes, mm. participation by citizens. Mm. It also includes uh, uh, the notion that there should be justice, fairness, uh, rule of law. All these are principles embedded in democratic governance. Mm. Okay? But let me make a point here. These principles are truly, in my view, they are universal. They are universal, except that in communist or socialist countries, they tend to suppress it. And it's the suppression of these principles in communist or socialist countries that normally lead to, or in the olden days, would lead to uh, upheavals, people resisting okay. and therefore having change in governments. Okay? Mm -hmm. So even if uh, you, are, you are in a, de a democratic society, and your government tends to be chipping away those freedoms and liberties that mm. we cherish, mm. you're going to find some kind of rebellion. Mm. That's why some, in some democratic countries they have a lot of difficulties because governments will tend to uh, undermine those freedoms, those uh, principles that you mentioned. Mm. And once it gets to that, you are bound to have some challenge. So, so, so if, if any of those principles are overlooked, uh, disregarded, do we tend to call such a state or such governance democracy? It is still democracy, except that you have to modify the de definition. So, 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 so are, we, are we likely to say we, we are a democratic state yet we do not adhere to rule of law? Do we you still classify it as, exactly. as a democratic state? Well, let's say it's a, it's, a, it's a maimed or it's wounded democracy if the, <laughs> uh, the, the rule of law is severely taken away or Accountability? Account exactly. In democracy, we, like, we need to have accountability. We need to have transparency in the way government uh, uh, does its work, mm. uh, especially in the, in the financial sector, mm. building the economy. And uh, whatever that a government does, that mm. government must be accountable to the people. Mm. These are key, key, key uh, uh, principles that uh, democratic governments uh, must uh, ensure they, they are observant. So, mm. we, wh wherever you find in any democracy any of these principles being undermined by government, mm -hmm. then you're going to have voices being raised, especially mm. if that country has active civil society. Mm. They are going to raise their voices because they, we have to be always looking out for any possibility of a government undermining those principles. Because mm. given a free hand, mm. uh, all governments can be corrupt, politically mm. speaking. Mm. All of them can be tyrannical. All of them can be authoritarian. Mm. That's why democracy also requires an active and vigilant civil society mm. that puts the government uh, under check all the time. It means that, irrespective of the fact that certain principles are overlooked, are turned down, and it's affecting democracy, we still classify that country a, demo a democratic yes. state. Yes, because as I said earlier, democracy is always work in progress. Work in progress, very, very So if there's a, a, a 
brief reversal or somebody is undermining it. It doesn't take away mm. that democratic uh, context. Mm, mm. But what it does is to weaken it. Oh. So in a case where the weakening of these principles are, 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 are setting in, how should citizens respond to that? In various ways. Of course, raising your voices. At times, you know, these days you see you, in democratic you, you countries. You raise your voice and the, and, and the government of the day tells you, you that we are in power. We go on demonstrations. They tell you that you, you, your demonstration is actually an exercise well, you're going to do. then the government is preparing itself to get out because then th- that thing can come to a point where the government cannot resist. Haven't you seen in some democratic countries where uh, leaders have run away because citizens pushed and pushed and pushed? That's why I said earlier that. If citizens become docile, for instance, in a democracy, we're supposed to have a division of powers, right? The mm. legislature, the judiciary, and all. If the legislature is not constantly checking the executive, the executive literally will run amok. Mm. That's why those institutions must be respected and they be, they, they must, they, all of them must be strong enough to mm. check each other. Mm. Look, I see some 14 principles that um, uh, that ought to actually govern a country which in holistic moments we will say, yes, this is the pinnacle, the top notch of our, of our democratic state, i.e. rule of law, acceptance of election results, free courts, uh, free and fair elections, human rights, bills of rights, freedom of economy, control over abuse of power, multi-party system, political tolerance, transparency, accountability, equity, and participation of citizens. So all of these principles ought to work simultaneously, isn't it? Yes, it must be respected by the political authority, that is, the elected government. Right. So at the back of that, what then happens or becomes the, 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 the state of a country if focus has been shifted from, from, from distance, does it undermine our democracy? It does. And in fact, most of the challenges in Ghana and also in Africa is the uh, occasional, uh, what I would say, occasional uh, inability of governments to respect all these principles. Mm. And that is wh- where you find people quickly reacting. Mm. In fact, an active and aggressive civil society, I will have to repeat, mm. is an important aspect of democracy. In other countries, i.e. Togo, civil society organizations are blacklisted. Their mouths are gagged. Mm-hmm. The media is gagged. You're unable to, to, to really speak up. Mm-hmm. Recent uh, reports by Afrobarometer indicates that citizens' confidence in democracy has declined, that they even want a return of the military rule. How then do we consolidate all of these principles for democratic development? You see, for democracy to survive and be stronger, you need governments, elected leaders, Mm. who themselves believe in it, Mm. Because if the leader believes in it, I'm sure that leader will do what it, whatever it takes to ensure the success of democratic practice. Mm. So in the case of Togo that you cited, go to their history and figure out how they came to where they are. Mm. The father Yadema, who was a military man, overthrowing a civilian government of Olympia back in the 60s, mm. stayed on that uh, seat for about uh, 35 40 years and somehow managed to get his own son to replace him. Mm. So, that in itself tells you that that leader successfully created a system that wasn't democratic, mm. but whenever he was pushed to open up to make the country more uh, democratic, mm. they will camouflage that change with all kinds of things and mm. uh, build some other people up. To protect the system, mm. you see. So uh, Togo has never been truly classified as a democratic country. Right. Democracy so, and freedom is never given on a silver platter. Mm. Democracy and freedom is never given on a silver platter. Citizens would have to fight for their rights. These are the very words of 
Professor Bafo Ajimandia, Executive uh, Chief Executive Officer with the Johnny Jikum Kufu and a co-founder of CDD Ghana. Well, listeners, we're still live in Ghana and we're having a conversation about um, fundamental principles of democracy on Citizens Are. Your thoughts and comments are massively welcome on all of our social media platforms. Doc, you talked about, um, you try to at least give reasons uh, People would want to stay in power for long and then undermine these core principles. So definitely take the principles one after the other. But interestingly, there is an interesting turn in Guinea-Bissau where the president Umaru Sissoko Mbalo has actually vowed not to Ali, go for the second time again. Is this a leader making a difference? Or, I mean, what would you say about such a leader or the move by Mbalo, President Mbalo? I think uh, President Mbalo may have realized that usually when a president seeks to uh, overstay, uh, the revulsion against that decision is widespread mm. on the continent and elsewhere. But so, this is one who is vowing not to go for second term. Yeah, exactly. So he decided not to go for the second term. Maybe he wants to set an example. I, I believe... But he's vowed also not to give power to the opposition, describing him as criminals. <laughs> That's a contradiction there. Mm. Because the power doesn't belong to him. Mm. Again, that's an interesting point about democracy. When you get power in a democratic uh, context, mm. the power doesn't belong to you, and therefore you cannot say, I will not give it back to you because you are so and so. Mm. It is the people who should decide mm. who gets the power. Mm. That's why you conduct elections. So if the people, in their collective wisdom or in their collective foolishness, decides to. <laughs> Uh, vote for a criminal, mm. unfortunately, that will be, mm. you see, because if we have laws that uh, prevents criminals from contesting elections, mm. then that law must be activated mm. as soon as you see a criminal coming forward. Mm. You understand? So, so, so that is actually contextual. Yes. The, 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 the usage of the criminal... Uh, exactly. Is, That's why in all countries, constitution mm. will give the eligibility uh, criteria, so to speak, mm. for, for those who qualify. Mm. So if uh, one of the criteria is uh, uh, nobody, you shouldn't have been convicted, mm. then you cannot even stand for the elections. Mm. You see, the interesting thing, people regard America as being the citadel of uh, democracy, but you know, in their constitution, they don't, they do not prescribe any sanctions against a, a criminal mm -hmm. to run for office. office, so that Donald Trump can be president, despite mm -hmm. the fact that he's been convicted on thirty-two or thirty-three counts. Mm -hmm. You see, interesting. Democracy is it expensive? It is expensive uh, in terms of uh, well, both in terms of uh, uh, monetary cost and also in terms of making the wrong choices. Mm. In terms of the monetary cost, look, these days to conduct elections uh, and for politicians to win, a lot of money is expended. Mm. In modern days, you want to have a campaign, so you buy vehicles to go around the people, you have to hire people who will be talking for you. It's very expensive in terms mm. of money. Mm. Then the other side of the expensiveness of democracy is when the people, again, uh, collectively decide on electing somebody who doesn't deserve to be president. Mm. That becomes expensive. And I'm looking at the American system, and I'm saying that, look, <laughs> from all standards, Donald Trump sh shouldn't be president. That right? is America. But, but in Africa, West Africa, in, in the case of Ghana? In the case of Ghana, I haven't seen those kinds of things, because it's difficult to tell whether a leader is going to be a good one until he, he, he or she yes, is in yes. power. You talked about reason people would want to stay in power for long, and we, we asked the question about what about systems not really working? If stronger institutions and, and systems are working, I remember the very words of the late president, um, Jerry John Rawlings. He said, we need to build a system where even if the devil comes to sit on it as president to rule, based on the principles and dictates that those institutions have um, established, the devil will not even find his way out. What is wrong with our, with, with, with our systems and institutions biting hard and ensuring the good of the people? You see, I've heard this many times. 
We all talk about strong institutions, like Obama came to Ghana and made the same point. Mm -hmm. What we need uh, uh, is a strong institution or strong man. But you see, don't forget that when we talk of strong institutions, mm -hmm. we are talking literally about the people who head or run that institution. Mm -hmm. Institutions by themselves. Is it the people who, who head that institution or the dictate and establishment in those institutions? Well, that also could be true. But first, first of all, if you set up an institution, you build it on certain premises mm -hmm. in terms of the rules, regulations regarding the operations of that institution, mm -hmm. its mandate, objective, and all those will be spelled out. Mm -hmm. And they can look as beautiful as anything on the paper. On paper. Now the next level of the institution will be what? The people will place in charge of that institution mm. and how they seek to deliver the mandate and make sure the rules and regulations are enforced. Mm. Doc, interesting. 14 principles here. We want you to um, let look at it bit by bit and then we would... We'll, 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 what does it mean to say equality in a democratic principle as part of principles equality normally in democracy is equality before the law it, which means no matter how small big poor rich uh, you are we are all equal before the law so uh, a big businessman a big politician stealing should be treated the same way as a small uh, guy on the street stealing. Is that the reality? Unfortunately, nowhere in the world is that the reality. Unfortunately, these are. So, this is blatant disregard to the principle of equality it's not in blatant democracy. blatant disregard. It is spelled out. Now, who enforces it? See, that's why earlier we were talking about institutions, mm -hmm. whether they are strong or not. And I, I mm -hmm. made a point that depends on who is managing it. Mm -hmm. A particular president can simply overlook the enforcement of certain things. The president doesn't enforce, I know. It's the judiciary that will arbitrate when there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. And they have the power and it's been spelled out for them whether you are jailed for this number or you are not jailed or you can be. All kinds of things mm -hmm. there. So when somebody is facing such a problem and you go to court, the judge must be just like in, talking about institutions, the, strong, the strength of institutions, mm. the judge must be as good as the law that is applied, mm. so that we can apply the law blindly. In other words, not this, looking at somebody's face and say, you go to jail for 10 years, mm. and the same crime committed by another person will give him one month, you see. So that is the concept of equality. equality. And the principle of equality. Yeah, the principle of equality. It doesn't mean we will all be treated equal, but that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. So the further you move away from that expectation, if you are in government, then the 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 more the problem people will have with you because then you are very far away from it. Mm -hmm. The closer you get to it, the more respect you get as a democrat. Mm -hmm. Prof, the principles are a lot. We'd want you to at least box some and then we would be able to, as time is also. Okay. Um, freedom of economy, and you, you tie that with, you know, Kevin, corruption. Corruption is a major, major, major uh, problem in Ghana, in many other African countries, in West African countries. And it's not unique to this part of the world. Corruption exists everywhere in the world. In the United States recently, a certain senator was forced to uh, withdraw from the Senate and he's been tried and he's going to be uh, jailed. That's the so, system working. Exactly. <laughs> so systems work well in a country mm. where there's a popular acceptance mm. of the law mm. and the, the, where there's greater willingness mm. to enforce the law. Mm. But if you're in a country like Ghana, where commitment to the law is... So, mm. and uh, 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 and then the application of the law is influenced by so many things, even not directly by uh, the big people in politics, mm. maybe by your culture. Because in Ghana, if you commit a certain crime, you do something wrong, you're a chief. 
Mm. Wherever you come from, your chief will early morning go to the president or the minister and say, oh, this is my boy, this is my, mm. my, uh, my nephew. You know, so those cultural influences mm. go a long way in determining the success of law application. Mm. And for me in Ghana, it's one of the biggest challenges. Mm. Political tolerance, where one political party feels is far, far better than the other. Well, that, that I think that's natural, you know. <laughs> if you're a political party. It comes at the back of competition. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> you have to prove yourself while mm. you say you are better mm. to get the attention of the mm. public to get their votes. Free courts and accepting election results. Free courts. Courts. Well, if there's a dispute in any country, I'm sure the constitution will have said that uh, these courts, the court will be the final arbiter. So if, uh, if uh, you, there's election and you're not happy with it, as we have had in Ghana on two occasions, mm, yeah. you go to the court, the court will sit as, as they did, and finally they give their judgment. Mm. And once the judgment is given, maybe the matter is closed. Mm. Or at times there's also room for... Uh, what do you call appeals, appeal. and you can appeal and appeal until you hit the ceiling where you can no longer appeal. So, again, all these things are structured by the constitution. Mm. Control of abuse of power, yeah, that's a very important uh, element in democracy. And here again, uh, we have to talk about the institutions uh, of democracy, uh, the legislature being capable of checking abuses by the uh, the president. Mm. Again, we're talking about civil society being alert to its responsibility of cross-checking uh, uh, governmental mm. actions and all, on and on and on. Mm. Look, anywhere in the world, mm. in politics, if you do not check the executive, mm. they become authoritarian. Because unfortunately... Can you repeat that? Anywhere in the world, mm. where... Uh, the institutions that are set up to check the executive, including civil society, if you are not alert to your responsibility, you will find a very good president becoming a bad one. Mm. Because it seems to me that the human nature is such that when not constrained, mm. they act recklessly. Prof, conversation getting much more interested and much more engaging and educative them all but unfortunately this where time would obviously uh, permit us finally before we take a leave off for you and of course uh, your office any 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 anything you'd want to say to um, african countries african leaders i.e as election is fast approaching guinea bissau ghana and cote d'ivoire in the coming in the coming year we all know that uh, we go into elections uh, expecting to win. But unfortunately, in any competition, only one person may win. And if it's a draw, the constitution say go back again. But I think oftentimes in African countries, we are impatient to, to win power. And therefore, we even create obstacles on the way of having successful elections. Secondly, because of the uh, overwhelming powers of presidents in Africa, mm. some are able to influence the electoral commissions mm. in making uh, decisions or manipulating the process uh, to, to favor somebody else. Mm. So in Africa, whenever elections are coming, tension rises, mm. okay? like we experienced in Ghana. So I think we have to begin to understand mm. that uh, where everybody participates and where we have the laws and the rules and the regulations regulating these things mm. and where we have strong institutions, mm. then we can have confidence mm. in the process of democracy. Mm. But where people's confidence are deflated mm. by the misbehavior or behavior of authorities, then you're going to have suspicions and therefore tension. At the back of that, confidence and people losing it in institutions. In the case of Ghana, a clear example, just yesterday, the Electoral Commission came to debunk all of the assertions of the opposition party without even giving a recourse to, should we look into it or not? Outrightly saying, 
everything they're saying is 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 is, is, is not true. It's untrue, and they have a robust uh, voter yes. register. And even the the demonstration, which is set to happen on the seventeenth of September, is 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 nothing. If the institution is giving room for 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 such or passing such comments like this, what should opposition do? What should citizens also do? Because in this case, the the institution is the one informing, and then a group of citizens who are by by default opposition also punching holes. Now the institution is now communicating largely or on a mass basis and citizens who ordinarily we are listening to both parties are also confused what then becomes the state of the of the ordinary citizen well uh, i am aware of uh, the situation yesterday that you just described uh, certainly one part the opposition party has raised a lot of complaints about the upcoming elections in terms of their distrust of the process because of their perceived uh, notion that uh, the EC is biased and all that. And that is expected. Uh, unfortunately in Ghana for the past 32 years, every election has been characterized by such suspicions. And I think it's all because of the distrust in the Electoral Commission. And I think that distrust can mainly because the commissioners are appointed by the president. So if the president, incumbent president, uh, appoints these people and we are going to election. Naturally, the opposition will, will lose some kind of confidence because the belief will be that the president appointed his favorites mm. and therefore they are going to favor the president's party. Mm. That's why I, I uh, advocate for uh, a change system of appointments. Mm. I don't think the president, for that matter, in other countries, president should appoint electoral commissioners. Mm. Electoral commissioners must be appointed by a neutral body. We can constitute a neutral body that every year can come together and, and uh, appraise and then appoint uh, qualified people to take out the politics, take it out from the commission's work. Mm. So far as presidents continue to appoint them, opposition parties will always distrust or mistrust them. Professor Bafo Ajiman Duya, Chief Executive Officer of the John E. Kufo Foundation and also co-founder of the Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. Thank you so much for your time on West Africa Democracy Radio. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. So, Imo, this is where we actually end the conversation. Of course, it's been lots of insightful uh, discussion with Professor Bafo Ajimandia on the fundamental principles of democracy as we seek to use radio as a tool to deepen and strengthen democracy. Demo. From Accra, Ghana, my name is Christopher Ticho. Back to you, Imo, in Dakar. That was my colleague, Christopher Ticho, there speaking to our guest, Professor Bafo Diamandua. And that's much uh, we can take on this edition of Citizens Hour. This has been a production of West Africa Democracy Radio 94.9 FM Dakar with support from the National Endowment Fund NED. We would love to hear from you. Do send us an email to wadr at wadr.org. Thank you for listening and many thanks for listeners and our partner stations, Voice of Liberia FM 104.1 in Rovia and Kwateke Radio 100.9 FM Bong County. In Ghana, we say thank you to our listeners on Radio Part, Savannah Region, Royals FM Wenchi and Focus FM Kumasi. We also thank our listeners on Albatica Radio 97.5 FM Bauchi and Darling FM 107.3 Oweri, South East Nigeria. And on African Young Voices 101.6 FM, Freetown, and Radio Gaff 91.3 FM, Mal 91 in Sierra Leone. And in the Gambia, on Hilltop FM Radio. Do join us next week for another edition of the program. I am Imo Edit. Bye for now. <laughs>